My name's Mark O'Neill. I'm one of the faculty members here at the National Security College. I'd like to welcome you to the National Security College's public seminar for September, titled End of an Era, US Economic Policy Challenges and the Implications for America's Asia-Pacific Strategy. I'd also like to add a warm welcome to our audience who's not physically here this evening, uh, those listening in on the vodcast and the podcast, which will be going up on the college's website. Welcome and thank you for your interest in the work of the NSC as well. Throughout history, economic strength has been the defining quality of great power. It has underpinned their ambitions, their influence, their diplomatic endeavours and their military strength. The question we pose tonight is, does the ongoing financial difficulties being experienced in the US and changing power relativities in the Asia Pacific herald possible strategic change? And what are the implications of any possible strategic change for US policy within our region? And we have two fine speakers tonight to address the questions posed by our seminar title. Firstly, Mr Mark Thurwell will address the economic and fiscal issues side of the question. Mark is the Director of the International Economy Program at the Lowy Institute for International Policy based in Sydney. He's been an, economic, an economist in the Bank of England's International Division and he also worked on structural economic issues in the UK with the same bank and their analysis division. He subsequently joined the firm JP Morgan as a Vice President in the Economic <coughs> Research Department prior to emigrating to Australia. Initially when he came to Australia he worked for the Export Finance and Investment Corporation prior to taking up his position with the Lowy Institute. Following Mark, uh, Professor Thomas G Mankin will address the strategic policy implications of these changes. Tom is currently the Jerome E. Levy Chair of Economic Geography and St National Security at the US Naval War College in Rhode Island. He's also a visiting scholar at the Philip Merrill Center for Strategic Studies at the Johns Hopkins University's Paul H. Nitze School of Advanced International Studies. Tom served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Policy Planning from 2006 to 2009, working for both Secretaries Rumsfeld and Gates. He was the primary author of the 2008 US National Defense Strategy and a contributing author to the 2006 US Quadrennial Defense Review. <coughs> He's also a, uh, been a serving officer in the Navy and currently still serves, I believe, as a Naval Reserve Officer in the United States Navy. Our format tonight, each speaker will speak for between 20 and 25 minutes on their assigned topic. And this will be followed by a plenary discussion where we will explore in greater depth the themes presented and entertain questions from you, the audience. As usual for National Security College events, even if we don't start on time, we will certainly finish on time and uh, we will leave at 6.45pm uh, for you to pursue the rest of your evening. Prior to start too, please, the usual disclaimers, uh, please turn your phones to silent or off so that our presenters and our enjoyment of the uh, seminar won't be disturbed. Uh, if anyone needs to leave in a hurry, the two emergency exits are obviously the door through most of us came through down here to my left, your right. Similarly, there is an exit to the rear right of the room as you sit, and that is noted with the exit sign. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, and Mark, I'd invite you to address the seminar. <coughs> Thanks, Mark, for the introduction and to the college for the opportunity to be here and for you for turning up to listen to me. Um, I'll begin with uh, something of a confession. Um, most of my career has been looking at emerging markets rather than at uh, the big developed economies. And basically, when I started off as a little baby economist, you kind of had a choice if you were being an international macro guy in the way you took your career. You know, choice or route one was you looked at the big developed economies. And the attraction was that these were the economies that basically drove the world economy. They were the things that were really important. Um, but the downside was that they, they were kind of dull. Um, you know, if you wanted to think about how, how you forecast those, you sort of knew that they, they basically ground along roughly at trend growth and you up or down a little bit depending on where you were in the cycle. And even recessions were kind of predictable because you looked at what the central bank was doing, wait for it to tighten, and then growth would slow. Um, so the other option that you had, is, and it's the, the path that I went down, is that you could think about emerging markets or developing countries, as we used to call them in those days. And there, the sort of the trade-off was, well, not as important, not as central to the world economy, but just much more exciting. 
Um, you can have growth miracles, you can have takeoffs, and you can also have all of the downsides as well. You can have sovereign debt crises, you can have bank runs, you can have ratings downgrades, all the things that would never ever happen, of course, in a rich developed economy. Uh, times have changed. Um, in fact, it's quite striking. If you look at some of the economists who got it closest to right, nobody got it right, but got it closest to right about what happened to the world economy in 2007, 2008, 2009, um, a bunch of them are people who cut their teeth looking at emerging market crises, uh, particularly the Asian financial crisis, and then took those lessons and applied them to the developed world. So things have kind of got interesting since then. Um, thinking about sort of the U.S. economic position and where we're at today, it was sort of symptomatic, I think, of, 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 sort of the concerns that people have was what, ha what we saw happening over June, particularly July and August of this year. And if you remember, running up to right until the 2nd of August, there was sort of this debate amongst U.S. policymakers about whether or not they were going to raise the debt ceiling. And it was, you know, there was sort of kind of this issue about whether the United States was going to actually fall into technical default uh, to its creditors, which, for the rest of the world, watching on in, I think, in amazement, really, it was like there was this serious public debate about whether you should take a gun and shoot yourself in the foot or not. It was kind of a stunning thing to watch. And basically... Although there was it, right at the last minute, the deal was cobbled together. It wasn't enough to stave off Standard & Poor's on the 5th of August deciding that no longer was the United States worthy of being a AAA credit. Um, we got that downgrade from AAA to AA+. Plus. Um, the way, of course, that this happened was damaging not just to the credibility of the United States, but also to the credibility of Standard & Poor's, which turned out that they made a rather large error in their, uh, in their calculations as to a US fiscal position. And um, the, the ratings agency credibility perhaps took another blow when um, what happened after they downgraded U.S. debt was, surprise, surprise, not a panic-stricken run on the U.S. Treasury market, but instead it would have decided that in this new scary world where the U.S. wasn't AAA rated by one of the two big rating agencies, what you should really do is go out and buy more U.S. debt and <laughs> drive in, uh, up the price and down the yield on U.S. paper. But even so, there was, kind of, there was something fundamental about that, about the statement that, that justified the downgrade. Um, you know, a bit of the boilerplate was about the fiscal position, but the kind of the other thing that Standard Poor's cited was that they were, they basically thought the effectiveness, the stability, and the predictability of U.S. or American economic policy making and institutions more generally had been weakened. And basically, after having watched the debacle that was the debate of the U.S. debt ceiling um, discussion, who could disagree with that? And certainly, it turns out that Americans themselves didn't disagree with it. Here's a chart looking at um, the congressional approval. Um, tracking it over time, and while, as Gallup themselves point out, America has never actually been that keen on Congress. The average approval rate in here kind of has been around the 30, 30%, 33% level, it's bouncing around quite a bit. Um, shortly after that debt, debt, that debt debacle, it was down at an all-time record low of about 13% approval rate. It's eked up a little bit to 15%. And you know, the, the, the response of um, people at Gallup asked about, well, what did you think about the way that all of the institutions of the U.S. government, you know, the, all of the, the group together handled this, and the sort of the adjectives were stupid, disgusting, ridiculous. Um, it, it wasn't a good look for U.S. economic policy. And basically, my thesis is going to be that the big fundamental challenge for the U.S., or the big economic policy challenge for the U.S., is governance, is getting the policies right. I'm going to talk about what some of the economic policy challenges are, but I think, certainly from the outside's perspective, they're all actually surmountable. They're all manageable. You can think of the policy tweaks that you can do. Some of them are harder than others, some of them are easier than others. But as long as you get the, the politics and the policy making part of it right, then you can solve them. And the big question, it seems to me, is not an economics one in the end of this, it's a sort of a political and social one about can the policy makers deliver. Um, a slightly different way of thinking about this, and Mark touched on it, I guess, at the beginning, is thinking about the US economy in relative perspective. And you know, it's clear that one of the reasons that we spend, particularly in strategic conversations, we spend a lot of time thinking about the future of the US economy, is this sense that it's in relative decline, or relative economic decline. Um, and that's true, but it's not a new story. Um, basically, since about 1944-45, when the US share of world GDP peaked, and I've got a guesstimate here at about 35% of the world economy on a purchasing power parity rate, if you did it at the US dollar rate, you'd shunt all of these lines quite sharply upwards, so this is a conservative estimate of of the U.S. share of the world economy, and basically since then it's been on a declining trend. And that's not about U.S. economic failure, though. I think that the crucial point there is it's about that the rest of the world, over time, gradually gets its act together. 
So post the Second World War, Europe and Western Europe at the first, and then Japan rebuild their economies from the rubble. So you know, US, US output peaks because it basically was extremely successful and didn't get smashed to pieces during the Second World War. And then as other economies come on stream, its relative share of world output starts to trend down. And then as developing economies or emerging markets, as we now call them, gradually start to get their acts together, start to industrialize, start to do modern economic growth and get takeoff, then their share of world output goes up and the US's share of world GDP comes down. And from my perspective, from the perspective of an economist, this is just kind of a natural process. Um, so if you care about relative gains, as I guess strategic thinkers have to, then you sort of worry about this stuff. But from an economic policy perspective, this is how the world works. It's not a symbol to me of US economic failure. It's a symbol of other people's success. And whether this trajectory continues or not, and the, you know, the striking point on this chart is that on the IMF numbers, which is the smaller of the two lines, 2009, roughly for the first time since this, before the Second World War, US share of output dips below 20% and continues to trend very slowly downwards. Um, that will continue to happen, assuming that the rest of the world, particularly the big emerging markets, continue to get their economic policies right. If they don't get their economic policies right, then that might continue to happen, but if they do, it will. And pretty much nothing that the United States does in terms of economic policy will change that trajectory. You know, it's not a symbol of things going wrong in the United States, it's a symbol of things so far going right in the rest of the world. Um, two other sort of little caveats about that are things that are worth thinking about. Um, it's clear that those relative shifts concentrate the mind and make people think or worry about relative economic performance. And I kind of dug out these two sets of opinion <coughs> polls. You know, one is from January 2011, where Americans were asked by, uh, I think it's Pew, who's the world's leading economic power? And I think about 47% of them picked China, um, a significantly smaller number picked the United States. So there is that perception that there's been a shift <coughs> in the balance of economic power in the world economy. But it's sort of a, a, just a gentle reminder Here's the same question also asked back in January 1989, when Americans were even more convinced that Japan was the world's top economic power. About 56, 57% of those asked picked Japan, and a slightly smaller number picked the United States than picked the United States in, 2000, um, in 2011. Of course, this year, when, when Americans were asked where, where's Japan, only 9% of them thought that uh, Japan was the world's leading economic power. Perceptions can change pretty dramatically. Uh, it's also true that the Chinese don't buy the Americans' argument. I think there was an April 2011 poll where the Chinese were asked who's the world's leading economic power. About, I think, 50% of them still picked the United States. 26% said China. Um, so the relativity question, it's an interesting one and it colors the debate, but it's also one that can be subject to quite rapid shifts. And certainly, if you're gaining, if you're doing an analysis and thinking about countries with economic problems, for every economic problem that I can find that the United States has, I can look at every other credible contender for world's leading economic power and find at least one and possibly two major economic policy challenges there too. So that's also worth bearing in mind. So that said, with those caveats out of the way, um, what, am I, what, what, what are what I think are the big economic policy challenges aside from that government's challenge? or that that government's challenge has, has to meet <coughs> the United States going forward. Um, I've decided to pick four for this evening. Um, the, and I'll focus mostly on the first two, because I think they sit most closely with the current public debate, but, um, but I'll, I'll have an, add another two at the end as well. So the four are, firstly, just getting out of the current recession, um, the worst and the deepest economic downturn since the Great Depression of the 1930s. And the second one is fiscal and financial fragility. You know, that standard was downgrade is kind of a symbol of that. But it's also one when people think about US strategic power or US power in the world that they, they focus back in on again and again. What's happening with the US budget deficit? What's happening with the explosion in US debt? So that's sort of the, the, the two, first two. The second two are, um, I think, inequality. And what's, you know, the, the, so that certainly if you read the US press, it gets an awful lot of attention. What's happening for the future of the American middle class? I think understanding that part of the debate is maybe useful in understanding that policy issue right at the beginning about the governance problems, the governance issues, and why the political environment has got so difficult. And then I'll finally I'll talk about the financial crisis problem, because it's partly a result of, you know, the financial crisis issue is partly why we are where we are here today, and it's whether, we're gonna, whether we've actually solved that or whether we're going to head <coughs> into a rerun. So they're the, the four that I'll run through. So the first one is just getting out, of the, uh, getting out of the current recession, getting out of the current hit to the world economy. Um, if you've seen already, the IMF has uh, just published its latest round of economic forecasts for the world economy, 
and it slashed its forecast for US GDP growth both for this year and for next by a full percentage point. Um, for an economy that we're already in the growth forecast wasn't that exciting given the depth of recession, this is not a good news number. It's, it's pretty bad. Um, basically, as, as we all know, the US outlook, US economic uh, production fell off a cliff as a result of the global financial crisis. And output today is still not back to where it was in 2007 before the crisis hit. Uh, so the big challenge, if you like, is getting back to pre-crisis output and then beyond. In fact, in catching up all of that lost growth, that lost output. <coughs> and we're just, we're just not doing it. Now, there's a, a, a famous economic model. Um, Milton Friedman came up with it. It was called the, the plucking model. I just have to be careful when I say that, because if I say it wrong, it sounds like I'm being really rude about Milton's economic model. <laughs> um, but the plucking model basically said economies are a bit like on a having a piece of string. Um, it, when you pull it down, uh, on a, say on a guitar or something, you pull, further you pull it down, the quicker it snaps back. So for your typical US recession, this is kind of my, goes back to my old point about you know, boring developed economy forecasting. Um, the bigger your initial recession, the further you pull the piece of string down, and the faster it snaps back up at the end of it. You get these V-shaped patterns of recoveries. And that was kind of how you used to forecast recessions, not just in the US, but across much of the developed world in general. Um, in terms of the kind of the picture you get on that chart, that would say on that line there that you've got, the, the, the deeper your recession, the bigger your fall in output, then the faster that you bounce back. And you know, the, gray, the gray points on that are past recessions, which fit reasonably okay with that model. And the current episode is the point in red, and it says that model really doesn't work for the current recession. Um, the second one compares the same sort of recovery paths over time, and again, the current episode is the one right at the bottom, much worse than previous, pre previous recovery and recession paths. Um, the thing is, this shouldn't have been a surprise. If you look at the sort of the literature that was being written in 2007, 2008, what we knew post the crisis was, if you have a big financial crisis, um, basically if you wreck your financial system, and if this, is glo if this is transmitted globally, so a lot of other economies go down at the same time, then a study of past historical examples tells us recovery is going to be slow, it's going to be painful, it's going to be associated with a prolonged period of unemployment, with a large increase in government debt. But people kind of forgot that in the sort of the period when you got the initial snapback. Once, you know, once we discovered that the world actually wasn't going to end after all, that the Fed had sort of saved us and that fiscal policy had worked a bit and we started to bounce back, we, you know, there was sort of a, a forgetting about these lessons. Unfortunately, these lessons are now back with a sort of sobering reality that post these kind of crises, it's a painful recovery process. One crucial consequence of it being a slow and painful recovery process is that people don't get their jobs back very quickly. Um, you know, one of the striking facts about this US recession and recovery path is that we still have 9% unemployment rates in the United States. We have these big falls in employment to population ratios. We have a large number of Americans out of work, and an even large, another large number who are discouraged and dropped out of the labor force. And again, if you think about sort of the political problems that were driving that governance issue at the beginning, then this presumably is another contributory factor to that. You know, unemployed voters are not happy voters in general. And politicians don't like unhappy voters. Um, again, what's striking about this, this kind of picture here, is that once upon a time, when again, when we thought about those boring developed economy forecasts, we thought unemployment rates or employment population rates were mean reverting. In other words, once they snapped away from their path, they bounced back to it again over time. Um, there's not an awful lot of sign of that in the current data. So again, one of the big challenges is how do you deal with this kind of recession and the sort of recovery that we've got, which we saw a little bit in the past two downturns as well, and a phrase that we're hearing a bit more of, jobless recoveries. You know, how, you know, how do you get, not only do you get growth back up, but how do you get growth back up in such a way that it brings employment with it? So one of the key economic policy challenges, I think, for the United States at the moment, and not just for the United States, but for a whole swathe of the developed world in general, is how do you pull yourself out of this truly nasty global, uh, uh, of this truly nasty downturn, and do it in a way that not only gets your economy back on track, but gets your people back in work at the same time. Second and related challenge, because one potential answer to the first one is, what do you do policy stimulus? Um, the second related challenge is, what do you do fiscal <coughs> policy in the United States? So policy stimulus would be monetary policy, cut interest rates, print money, um, while conventional monetary policy, cutting interest rates, has gone as far as it can go. So we've been trying non-conventional monetary policy, printing money, to diminishing effect over time. 
The other thing you can do is you can run budget deficits. The government can try and chuck more demand into the economy. Uh, the constraint on that, of course, is that if you've been running large budget deficits already, then the ability to keep doing that starts to get questioned over time. And depending on how you look at the United States, if you're a real pessimist, you say that since around about the 1970s, early 1980s, um, the United States has been congenitally incapable of running a fiscal surplus. Um, that there's been a sort of a structural change in the US economy that means that revenues don't keep pace with spending, that you keep getting budget deficit after budget deficit, and that that means that there's a fiscal problem at the heart of the American economy, and until you fix that, you can't do much about fiscal policy. That's kind of one view, and a lot of people have it. I'm not quite as pessimistic as that. Um, if you look at that, you'll see that from roughly 1998 to um, 2001, so for about four years, the US actually ran quite sizable budget surpluses. In fact, you can go back to, I think it's March 2001, and find a neat bit of testimony from Alan Greenspan to the US Congress, where he says that the real problem that the United States have is that the government's going to be running fiscal surpluses for too long, and that the federal government debt is going to disappear by the end of that decade, and that the government's going to start buying up assets. The problem is not that the US can't run budget surpluses, it's that it's being too effective in running budget, really budget surpluses. So in other words, US fiscal policy can adjust, it can actually deliver fiscal surpluses. And it did so up until about 2001. Um, so what went wrong? Well, post-2001, we, we slumped back into those big deficits, and basically you have a series of big tax cuts. Um, you know, the second Bush administration actually inherits a fairly large, I think a couple hundred billion dollar fiscal surplus from the Clinton administration but you get 2001 and 2003 large tax cuts, two wars, um, which are fought mostly on credit, so without trying to raise the revenue to do them, and then a major financial crisis, which involves things like TARP and bailouts, and then the usual standard effects of recessions on budget deficits. Revenues go down, spending goes up. So you get a series of shocks and policy choices that basically drive this explosion in the budget deficit. So my optimistic, if you like, or more optimistic take on this story is Yes, you can sort of look at that long term and say there is a long term issue about matching revenues and expenditures, but it can be done. It's been done in the past. There's no reason to believe that it can't be done in the future. And that there are just a, there's a series of events and policies that, that, that put us where we are today, and that those policies can presumably be changed or adjusted. An illustration of this is this is from the uh, Congressional Budget Office that looks at US deficits going forward, um, depending on what policies you choose. The, the brown bars are, I guess, the, the baseline scenarios. The light blue is what happens if you maintain tax cuts in place. Basically, so if you strip those out, if you take away some of those revenue cuts or do something, if you use something on the revenue side, then what looks on the baseline like this kind of quite scary US deficit profile suddenly starts to look much more manageable. So you can do things. The challenge, of course, is short term, how do you raise revenues or cut spending when you're still stuck in that nasty trying to recover from a recession environment? Um, and this gives you the sort of the conventional policy response that people give, give in the United States from outside the United States, from people like the IMF, which is the sort of the Augustinian approach to economic policy, you know, keep me chased but not yet, make me fiscal responsible but not yet, do it down the track. Second constraint on all of this is what's happening to your debt policy. If you run very large budget deficits over time, your deficits go up. Um, and we're now basically 2010, um, we have the highest level of <coughs> net and gross federal government debt since the end of the Second World War. That gives you a, a new set of vulnerabilities and it gives you things like standard and poor's rating down rates. It also means something different, interesting for um, in strategic consequence which is a, like Blanche de Bois, the US is increasingly dependent on the kindness of strangers. Um, back in 1960, about 5% of this debt was owned to foreigners. As of this year, it's something like 50% of this debt that the public is owned to foreigners. Of that, three quarters of it's owned to foreign governments and governmental institutions, and about one in five dollars alone is owned to China. Um, we might come back to that in questions about what, if anything, that does to uh, constrain US policy. Bond market doesn't care. Um, as I said, standard poor's down in the US. Bond market's completely relaxed about that process. In fact, the bond market is happy to give the US government almost free money. So, so there's no, if you like, market constraint short term on the, on the US debt burden. On the other hand, if you ask the IMF, um, quote from the last IMF Article 4, the US federal finances are on an unsustainable trajectory. Um, basically, on, even on US official budget estimates, 
by the end of uh, 2030, US debt to GDP is about 90%. Net debt and public balance to GDP is about 90%. IMF thinks it's going to be 95% by the end of this decade, heading rapidly for 100 and then exploding onwards and upwards after that. Why? Well, fundamentally because getting older is expensive. Um, there's a difference between those short-term pressures and policy hits, which I think explain the current deficit, which I think are amenable to one set of policy adjustments, and the medium to longer term strains, which are basically associated with an older population that's spending more and more on healthcare. Um, the two top lines there, if you look at spending in the absence of aging and cost growth, cost growth basically associated with healthcare costs, the fiscal problem is not so bad. Stick those in, it starts to look scary. The good news is you can fix this again with reasonably straightforward policy changes. For example, deal with effective aging, increase retirement ages, change the indexation of social security pensions from wages to inflation, um, or even modest tax increases. VAT, <coughs> introducing VAT or a sales tax, or heaven forbid a carbon tax. Um, you can raise you know, revenue with that and cover, cover off this stuff. It's stuff that you can do whether the, whether the politics can deliver it or not. Because I'm blowing my time, I said I'd just quickly talk about two other challenges which are not so much heard in the strategic debate, which I think are interesting, again, feeding back to that overall question about the, stru the structure of the, uh, of the governance issue and, and I guess the, the hyper-partisanship of US policy at the moment, political debate at the moment. One's just what's happened to US inequality. Um, this is the, the share of income of the top 10% of the US population. Basically, inequality in the United States today is back to where it was in the roaring 1920s. Um, you've seen a, a, a big shift in income distribution in the US. Um, what's behind that? All sorts of reasons. People argue about tax rates, they argue about unionization and the decline, they argue about different sorts of government policies. It seems to me that a big driver is just what's happening in labor markets globally, which is a squeezing in rich countries of the middle part of the labor market distribution and a rise at either end, the low end and the high end. Take that, transfer it through into economic policy and income distribution, and you get those kind of skewed income effects in the US. Why should we care? A um, couple of reasons. One is that the US is now pretty near the top of the wrong OECD league tables. Only Turkey and Mexico have higher rates of poverty and um, a bigger gap between rich and poor. That might be okay, because countries, in a sense, may be willing to trade off higher inequality or bigger levels of poverty, assuming you can offset that with higher levels of social mobility. And that's kind of what's been, I think, the American argument. If you churn, if your population churns quite rapidly, then if you've got a chance of being rich even if your parents weren't, you can kind of live with that. What's striking with, uh, with, with now in the United States is that not only do you have a much higher level of income inequality than the rest of the OECD, you're starting to have a much lower level of social mobility than the rest of the OECD too. So in other words, if your parents are poor, you're much more likely to be poor. If your parents are rich, you're much more likely to be rich. That gives you, that gives you an interesting, again, potentially political policy challenge. Final point, um, if all Americans haven't been, on average, haven't been doing too well, and so the US Census just told us that um, the average, the median household income in the United States this year is about the same, or sorry, last year was about the same as it was in 1996. So the US has already had its own lost decade and then some. Um, one sector, of course, has done very well, which is a sector that I used to work in for a while, investment banking. Um, it, despite it being the, uh, the center of the crisis, it's done very, it hasn't done too badly. Um, one, key quest, one key question going forward is, have things like Dodd-Frank prevented, are they going to prevent us having a, um, a, re, a rerun of the financial crisis that we've just had? I'm skeptical about whether that's going to be the case. Um, so in other words, you know, one big question for me about US economic policy challenges going forward is, what happens when we get the next major financial accident. So at that point, I know I've blown my mind. I shall finish, and thank you very much for your attention. Well, my untrained economic ear, what I got from that was that there are some problems, four in particular, two more significant than others, governance being the biggest one, but things perhaps aren't that bad in the longer term. However, Someone else owns a lot of this other money that the US uh, owes. So what does that mean? Focusing inwards on the governance, trying to address the problems that Mark has outlined? Well, to consider it within the Asia-Pacific strategic policy sense, uh, Tom's now going to address us and give us his thoughts. Thank you. 
Well, first off, thanks, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, as someone who, um, during my last stint in government, tried to uh, launch something very much like the National Security College for the United States and, and failed, uh, I've uh, been following from a distance uh, your, your progress here. Uh, and it's, it's great to actually be able to, uh, uh, to, to talk to you. Uh, if, you, if you came here tonight thinking you were going to hear a debate, I think you're going to be uh, sorely disappointed because I, I, Mark and I uh, basically agree. And, and among other things, I think we, we agree on the fact that while there are, you know, the, there are some uh, economic, uh, some, some, some uh, reasons to be uh, pessimistic economically, a lot of, I think, what we're seeing in the United States today reflects perceptions and sort of the way we're feeling about ourselves as much as it does uh, the economic, uh, economic fundamentals. But perceptions matter and politics matters. Politics rules uh, as far as <coughs> strategy is concerned. Um, so what I want to do is talk a little bit about the strategic consequences of, of the economic situation. Um, strategy is all about bringing ends and means into balance. That is, it's all about achieving your aims given constrained resources. And in fact, it is axiomatic that states, whether it's the United States or any other state, uh, that states faced constrained resources in trying to pursue their aims. Um, and certainly for the United States, the political reality is that we will face increasingly constrained resources for defense and national security. I emphasize political reality uh, because defense spending is neither the cause of nor the solution to U.S. economic problems. Um, you know, uh, defense spending has, has made a contribution uh, to, to the current economic situation. On the other hand, defense spending as I, as I total up and uh, try to evaluate the things that governments spend money on and their, their ability to stimulate the economy, defense spending is towards the top of my list of government expenditures that actually stimulate the economy. Um, politically, however, as I say, it's political reality. Politically, however, defense and national security spending is part of the discussion. So what I'd like to do in the, in the, in the brief time that I have is First off, talk about U.S. aims and objectives, U.S. commitments, particularly when it comes to Asia. Talk about resources, and then talk about options for balancing commitments and, and resources. And I'll say uh, up front that, that, these, that these options are mainly theoretical. Uh, that is, that the, the real range of choice for the United States today is actually fairly, fairly constrained. Um, but I think actually constrained in a way that hopefully should, uh, should be heartening uh, to, uh, to Australians and to our allies and friends in the Asia Pacific region. Um, I'll get to that in a moment. But let's, let's talk about US objectives. Um, the United States, I'd say as a, as a government, generally does a poor job of, of outlining in clear uh, declarative English sentences, what our objectives and what our interests and what our commitments are. Uh, fortunately, uh, I think the United States has a fairly consistent pattern of behavior going back, uh, in some cases, to World War II and in other cases going back a century. Um, really, there are five uh, interests that, that the United States has pursued in, in, uh, in Asia uh, over, over that time period. First, most basic responsibility of any government is, is protecting territory. And so for the United States, protecting US territory. That includes not only the, United, uh, the continental United States, uh, but also includes our, our uh, territory uh, in the Western Pacific. Second, defending allies. Australia, Japan, South Korea. Also, uh, our commitments to partners or quasi-allies, uh, such, as, such as Taiwan. Third, uh, protecting the commons, protecting the free flow of goods, uh, technology, resources, enforcing freedom of navigation, and, and, and so forth. Uh, fourth, preventing the emergence of, uh, of a hegemon on the Eurasian continent. The United States has repeatedly uh, gone to war over the past century uh, when it appeared that 
a one country and was, was becoming uh, powerful and a threat to, to world order. And finally, uh, promoting the common good in terms of uh, relieving uh, suffering, uh, responding to disasters, and so forth. I would say these five objectives uh, really represent a consensus, a, a broad consensus across administrations. Um, the consensus may break down over, say, how much to allocate to promoting the common good and humanitarian concerns relative to other things. It may break down as to well, what, you know, what exactly a, a threat to world order would look like. But on other areas, certainly protecting US territory, protect, defending allies, protecting commons, uh, there, is, there is a consensus. And I think that's something that's good. I think it's something that should be reassuring uh, to our friends and allies in, in Asia. Uh, but it also, and I'll come back to this in a minute, it also means that there's not a lot of leeway, there's not a lot of wiggle room when it comes to reducing US commitments. We'll come back to that. So the first variable has to do with our, our commitments and our, our aims. The second variable has to do with resources, the means that we have to, uh, to protect those interests. Every uh, US administration faces the challenge of balancing resources uh, against, against commitments. Uh, it's been institutionalized since the, since the uh, late 1990s <coughs> in a process that Congress uh, demands the, uh, the administration carry out. Uh, a quadrennial defense review, uh, the most recent of which was, was in 2010, the first of which was in 1997. Every four years, Congress demands that the administration look ahead, try to, try to uh, uh, articulate its strategy, um, and to try to figure out the resources that are needed to meet that strategy. Um, so the 2010 Quadrennial Defense Review is the most recent attempt uh, by the Obama administration to balance uh, aims against, against means. And as if that weren't enough, uh, this time around, uh, Congress uh, asked for a, uh, an independent panel, a Quadrennial Defense Review independent panel, to provide an outside look uh, at, at, this, uh, at, at this situation as well. I had the, uh, uh, the good fortune to, uh, uh, to serve as staff director for that, for that panel. Um, <laughs> What I would say is neither the administration's effort to, to balance ends and means nor the independent congressional look contemplated the economic situation or the political climate that we face now. Both of those, uh, those efforts assumed continued growth in, in defense spending. Um, and neither planned for the downward pressure that we now see on, on defense. Now, I will say, uh, and, and I will uh, I'll echo Mark, I think it's an extremely good thing uh, that the U.S. government is getting its economic house in order. And however, however untidy it may uh, uh, seem overseas, because I was one of these people that, uh, and I was actually in Australia as, as in the lead up to the, uh, uh, the, the, the deal, um, I was one of those people that, that thought that there was, there was close to zero chance of the U.S. defaulting. What, what you're seeing is the democratic process playing out in a very messy and, and public way. So I think, frankly, that it's, it's, a, it's a good thing that we are where we are today in terms of the political uh, discussion in the United States, because the United States government is now um, in a position to actually tackle some of the, some of the policy issues that, that Mark uh, outlined whereas that was not the case a year ago, and it was not the case two years ago. And if done well, again, with good policy choices, um, the U U.S. Can, will, uh, will wind up in a much stronger position. Back to all things being, being relative, the United States has a much uh, better opportunity to put itself in a strong position uh, than many other developed economies that are, that are facing uh, some, some dire situations themselves. Okay. But we do still face uh, the, the, the prospect of, of cutbacks in national security spending. Um, now, there are, there are really three theoretical options to, uh, to balance the books, if you will, between commitments and resources. Um, and I want to walk through them um, one by one. First is to, to reduce commitments, right? Theoretically, you could reduce commitments to match your resources. Second, you could increase your resources to match your commitments. Um, the third is essentially to tolerate a growing gap between commitments and resources, that is to accept greater risk. 
Well, let me, let me walk through those uh, each, uh, each for a couple minutes. There, there certainly is a school of thought, and I would say it's a school of thought that's more, um, more pronounced in academia than it is in government, that the U.S. should reduce its commitments. Um, and certainly, um, you know, there are those who call for the United States to move to what's uh, euphemistically called a, an offshore balancing strategy. Uh, reduce our commitments, uh, have our allies do more, less, less presence, uh, and, and so forth. So forth. Um, I think it's an it's a, uh, uh, intriguing academic argument, but I think it is not a realistic, uh, it's not a realistic option. Let's think back just a second to the, to the menu of, uh, of, of objectives that the United States has historically pursued. Protecting U.S. territory. I cannot envision this administration or any successor administration um, not putting that as number one. Uh, defending our allies. Similarly, I cannot envision a, a U.S. administration um, being willing to abrogate our treaty, uh, treaty commitment to, to our allies. Uh, protecting the commons. Um, I think that is, that is a, a whole realm of activity that should be viewed not as a cost, frankly, but as a benefit. In other words, the United States and our allies and everybody else, including not our allies, benefit from the free flow of goods and information uh, across the global commons. It's what has made globalization possible. Um, so I think talking about reducing commitments is something that is easier said than done. Um, increasing resources. Uh, increasing uh, national security spending. I, I happen to be one of these people that think that in, in some areas uh, the United States actually should do some more spending in, when it comes to national security in some particular areas. But I will admit that given the current political climate that is probably, that is probably unrealistic. So I think where we're going to go um, is uh, to accept greater risk. Um, that is to to tolerate a growing gap between our commitments and our resources. Now, I, again, I would not say that that's, uh, that that's desirable, uh, but I think it is, it is the most likely outcome. Well, what do I, when I say accept greater risk, what do I mean? Uh, what, I, what I mean is um, by, by drawing down some of our capabilities, uh, we're going to have to accept greater risk when it comes to deterring aggression, and also to reassuring allies. Greater risk in wartime translates into more lives lost and wars that go on for, for longer. Now, many of the things that we would normally do to reduce risk um, are unattractive, either unattractive politically uh, or, or expensive. We could invest in, in uh, new capabilities, for example, um, including follow-ons to some of the capabilities we now have that have actually uh, saved lots of lives, uh, but we probably won't, won't, uh, won't be able to do that. Um, other ways that we've reduced risk in the past is, is, is through burden sharing, but I think for a whole bunch of, uh, of reasons and individual reasons with, with individual allies, that's likely to, uh, to, be, to be problematic. I would say, though, that I think one of, one of the, the best ways to, to reduce risk is, is through our alliances. I think the United States is, is fortunate uh, for the, the portfolio of alliances that we have, particularly in, in, in Asia. And I think if we are smart, and when I say we, I mean the United States, I mean our allies and us together, I think we can we can do things that reduce risk and also deliver increasing increasing capabilities. We can talk about that more in in, uh, in, in question and answer if you'd like. Um, but what I really you know my, the things that concern me the most are things over the near term. I'll say just the next five to ten years. I think the challenge there is to uh, keep robust, uh, keep the U.S. engaged in the region robustly. Uh, to keep uh, us closely tied in with our allies and to compete as we get our economic house in order. In the far term, if 
uh, we tackle uh, our, our debt, um, the U.S., I think, will be in an extremely strong position. Um, if you look at demographics, I think demography plays heavily to, uh, to the United States. Um, and as Mark said, I think for every, for every problem uh, one can find in the U.S. economy, one can find two or three in uh, many of the other, uh, other economies. Uh, I'm one of these people that believes, uh, you know, you're, uh, you're, you're generally uh, uh, on a firm, a firm foundation if you bet with the market as opposed to uh, against the market. And I think betting with the market in the long term is, is betting with the United States. But right now, I think the concern is over the next five to ten years, and I hope it's closer to five than ten, uh, getting through this, uh, this rough spot. So hopefully I've said enough things that are provocative, and, and so did Mark, that uh, we can have, a, uh, we can have a, good, uh, a good discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, due to both our speakers uh, sticking to the, the time requested, we now have uh, some 20 minutes uh, to engage in a discussion and Q&A. Could I ask that uh, if you have a question, uh, you wait until the microphone uh, that uh, either Ash or Debbie uh, will proffer gets to you because as I said earlier we are recording this for vodcast and podcasts and we do want to hear what you have to say. Could I ask that you identify yourself, identify if you have any particular affiliation uh, that you care to share with us and also could I ask you actually ask a question. Um, there are other venues where we can make party political statements or uh, offer an extended opinion. So uh, with that in mind uh, the floor is open and uh, Mark and Tom will fill in your questions. So, okay. My name's David Tucker, uh, Department of Defence. Um, this one is actually for Mark, I think, so it's about economics and I don't know much about it. Um, I was interested in your treaties and why the markets aren't, or why the economy isn't responding the way it used to be. Um, and I've also been hearing about the fact that a lot of wealth, um, particularly in recent times, is built around derivative products that aren't actually backed by proper production. Um, is that, in your mind, going to have some um, factor in, is that going to factor in making it harder for the US to build a productive base to rebuild the strength in their economy? Um. It's kind of a, there's a, a two parts to that. I mean, one is this issue about how much of your economy is in production, and there's kind of a, a long-running debate about, particularly in rich developed economies, about is it scary that we have we're, we're so services driven nowadays, and should we worry about that? Um, and my broad answer to that is probably we shouldn't. Um, that, that that's kind of how development plays out. That there's sort of a stand, you know, a reasonably standard path of economic development. You start off in agriculture, you shut out agriculture into, serve, into industry, and then you go from industry to services in, a relative, in terms of a relative share of the economy. And I think that's kind of a natural process. We shouldn't worry too much about it. However, I think there's a, a subset, a, a second part of the question, which, is, which does worry me a little bit, which is have certain economies, the US being one, the UK possibly being another, some other rich economies, because of the way they've regulated and in effect implicitly subsidized the financial sector, grown financial sectors that are too big and that have distorted, if you like, the structure of their economies. And there I think there's at least some evidence that that's happened um, and that that's problematic, that it has distorted the economy, that it's had, it's had some benefits, but it's had some big costs, you know, not least of which has been the major crisis that we just had. So at a, at a big picture level, I'm kind of reasonably comfortable with structural change that happens. I think that's how economies work. But I think you can find individual things to worry about, about within the structures of some of those economies. And one of the things I worry about is that financial sector share. And you know, some, as I said, not all of that's bad, but there are parts of it that worry. Gentlemen in front. Matthew Mulrine. Yep. Sorry. Matthew Mulrine, no affiliation. Uh, my question goes to Tom, and you'll have to excuse me because I plead my ignorance in this area. but. Both in Australia and the US, the government seems to pay a lot of attention or has the aim of continuously increasing defence spending. Yet if we go all the way back to, say, the art of war, it mentions that the military is the tool of the state. Surely there are other tools as well. And do you see it? I mean, you are arguing the case for increased spending. 
is there not also an over-reliance on one aspect of governance? Well, part, look, part of the reason that, um, you know, that defense spending has been going up is that, you know, defense, the, the military has been progressively taking on more and more tasks that are traditionally not uh, standard military tasks. And, you know, I had the pleasure of working for a, for a defense secretary who was an ardent supporter of non-defense national security spending. Uh, he, you know, he testified repeatedly, Secretary Gates testified repeatedly in favor of greater budgets for, larger budgets for the State Department and USAID. Um, that hasn't happened. And it hasn't happened uh, for, I guess, un understandable political reasons, uh, which is for <coughs> whatever, whatever uh, challenges uh, the U.S. Defense Department uh, has with its committees in Congress, uh, it's a much better relationship than the State Department and USAID have with their committees in Congress. Um, again, for, for understandable domestic political reasons, uh, you know, defense translates into jobs. State and AID <coughs> translate into jobs. So when um, the State Department uh, formed the, you know, the um, um, basically uh, set up uh, SCRS for, for uh, crisis stability, stability operations and went to Congress first time for, for, with its budget request. It got slashed 95%. <clears throat> now, I don't think that's right, but again, it is political reality. And the political reality is you've had several secretaries of state, who, um, uh, both Secretary Rice and now Secretary Clinton, who've been ardent advocates for, for greater, greater funding for non-defense national security spending. You had Secretary Gates, who was an ardent, ardent uh, advocate, in part because you know, he, he was hoping that, 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 that the military could, could refocus more on purely military tasks. That hasn't happened. Um, and so as a result, you know, defense is bearing, is bearing more of those it's a traditionally non-defense cost. I think one of the, the unfortunate byproducts of the drawdown in defense spending is those, ex, you know, those, those expenditures are going to get cut as, as the military gets back to, back to basics. So the whole of government response and whole of government approaches, I think you're, you're not going to find anybody arguing against. It, it makes perfect, perfect sense. But when you put it into a political context, it's been something that's been exceedingly difficult to, to actually implement. And I won't even take the next step, which is to talk about the, the organizational challenges and the organizational cultural challenges of, of implementing some of those changes within those, those different uh, federal departments and agencies. It's a different matter, but just when it comes to funding, uh, easier said than done. That question reminds me of the apocryphal <coughs> statistic that Secretary Gates used to say that there were actually more members in bands in the US military than there were foreign service officers, which is a uh, Makes you pause for thought. Gentleman up the back, please. Okay, thanks. Uh, John McGarry, uh, Defence Intelligence. I think my question is primarily to Tom, but uh, Mark may want to comment as well. Um, given the ideological divide that exists within US politics, which I think is far more significant than the ideological divide we have within Australia, what, what, what makes you so confident, Tom, that the US can sort its political differences out? Um, and not go to the crisis, to the literally to the edge of crisis each time a matter such as um, the uh, recent uh, lifting of the um, deficit where <coughs> comes to a head. Um, in particular, given the concerns that uh, I heard for two years in the United States about the growth in entitlement spending, which Mark really didn't um, deal with, which is largely listed as the number one concern about where was the money going to come from, although I think your last graph did sort of point to that. What gives you um, confidence that instead of the boiling frog syndrome, where that we only get a crisis, we only get a political solution when we get to a crisis point, that we won't actually find ourselves with the water boiling over our heads before we realise, um, as a political institution, that the crisis has already pa passed? Well, I, I guess the, uh, you know, the, the optimism, if you want to call it that, comes, comes from, I think, that there is a realisation that we are at a crisis point in the United States. I mean, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll trust politicians to be politicians. They pay attention to their approval ratings as, as much as anybody. Uh, and when you have congressional approval ratings down at 15%, and where you have a presidential uh, approval rating that's right now at 41% uh, heading down, 
there's there's every motivation to uh, you know to do something about it. You know the the the, the underlying challenge is um, you said ide ideology. I mean, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll buy into that. But you know, the American system of government really is meant to to not a not permit large changes unless there's a consensus backing those changes. There is not a consensus right now um, in, in American politics. So our, our system is working the way it was designed to work. Um, but I do think, you know, there, there, we, are, we are at a point where there is a realization that something needs to be done. And, um, you know, uh, you know, Congress, um, well, uh, you know, both both uh, the president and uh, and and his uh, you know his his uh, uh, whoever his eventual opponent is in the presidential election will will both be running against Congress. So, uh, and congressmen and women will have to run for their seats too. So I, that's that's why I say. I mean, I, my my sense even you know last summer was that a lot of this was was political theater, and it was political theater that was aimed. At domestic constituencies was was broadcast across across the world, um, and it was you know both sides bargained hard and they bargained to the end and they got to sort of the the, the best uh, the best uh, uh, position that they could going right up to the brink. But again, in a larger in a larger span of history, we are now having discussions in the United States about issues that were. That, that were not discussed earlier. It was the boiling frog earlier, and now the you know now that uh, I think we're, we're we're beyond that. But I'd be interested in you know in, in Mark's uh, Mark's perspective from uh, from Sydney. Um, yeah, what was the? Can I take the economist away from his charts? <laughs> <laughs> so you basically, if you look at that debt profile, you've got two two stages of the problem. You've got the first one, which was where we're currently at, which is. You know, crisis, recession, past policies, and that's part part of the problem. And then, as I said, you've got the next one, which is the kind of getting old and having expensive healthcare. Um, and at present, you're, there is no there is no policy that deals with that. So when you look at all of those debt projections, you know, like the IMF one, as I say, even the conservative um, U.S. presidential budget assessments, basically these things just go onward and upward forever, and so they're clearly unsustainable. And as we know, it's we say in economics, something that's unsustainable will come to an end. You can't do it. So the question is how you fix it. You do it either by you have a debt crisis or you do it by policy. Um, my optimistic part of this is that I don't think the policies, certainly at least for the social security part, aren't that hard. As I say, you can tweak retirement ages, you can change the way you index benefits. You can even do it if you wanted to through tax increases. I mean, they, they wouldn't actually be that large to get social security back on track, you know, sales tax or something. So you know, my optimistic part of this is that the policy side of it you can do it and it's not that tough. Um, my big unknown, and I confess it is a complete unknown to me because I'm not a US political analyst, is whether the political system will deliver it. And I don't know whether it will, is my, is my honest answer. I mean, people have been talking about unsustainable debt trajectories in the United States, apart from that brief blip when we had you know, the, the four years of surplus during the Clinton administration, since I think 1974 or 73. So we knew that you know, people have known that this problem was coming for kind of a long time, and none of those policies have yet been put in place. So, so far, there's not a lot of slide in coming. We know what they are, we know that they're actually not that hard. I, I'm agnostic about how we live. I mean, I, I, I guess in the end, if you push me, I'm going to think that, yes, they'll get delivered, because in the end, you know, we, there, was, there was a lot of worry pre, uh, you know, through the 80s, for example, about an unsustainable US fiscal position. And when it started to get really, really bad, we had three waves of tax increases uh, you know, during the first, you know, the, the elder Bush presidency, and then two under Clinton, and basically US fiscal finances were put back on an even keel. And then that they've since unwound again. But it can be done. Whether it will be, I mean, the political scientists might be better placed to answer than the economists, I think. David. Thanks, Mark. And, uh, David Connery from National Security College. And my, my question actually follows on from John's. Um, you both talked about the importance of politics to this. And I'm wondering if we could uh, have a bit of a look at the influence of politics on America's strategic posture. Um, if I can characterise it really simply, I, I was, and very simplistically, it seems like the Democrats are more interested in what happens at home or what happens in the near region, and the Republicans tend to be a little more global. I'm wondering what impact the Tea Party might have on uh, Republican views and whether they might change that balance. Um, I'll, 
I'll, I'll take a, a slightly different twist on it. I mean, I think, I think you, you have a, basically an internationalist consensus uh, across most of the uh, American political spectrum, except for the far left and the, and, and, and the far right, where actually they actually, it's one area where they actually agree, is tend to have a, a more narrow uh, kind of conception of, 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 American, uh, of American power. Um, I think, you know, um, I'll just say a, a lot of the congressional freshmen, um, many who, you know, many of whom sort of are kind of align, aligned with the Tea Party. I don't I actually don't think that men, they're um, anti-internationalist. I just don't think that they've uh, thought a lot about um, international affairs, and they're, the reason that they were elected to Congress was to get the economic house in order. So I, I don't I don't think that that's really a, an an isolationist block or anything like that. I just don't. I, I think that they're uh, they're folks who just haven't haven't really thought, you know, thought seriously about about international affairs. And I think that's actually tends to be true about um, freshmen in Congress a, as a general rule. Uh, and and you know, and again, their their concerns really are with the the economics. So I think there, there's there's been a, a marginal uptick in uh, you know in 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 sort of isolationist sentiment, but. It's one of these things that, you know, again, maybe I'll be proven, proven wrong and, you know, Ron Paul will be the next president of the United States. I, I don't think that's going to happen, though. Uh, and, um, you know, that I think this, this isolationist turn of uh, the United States is something that's uh, perennially people fret about, but it just tends, tends not to, uh, to, to come about. Um, and similarly, I would say, if you look at presidents, I think it, it's very rare to see a president take office with a strong desire for an international agenda. I think presidents, by and large, come to office wanting to be domestic presidents, and then reality of one sort or another swats them upside the head, and they wind up, uh, you know, uh, being being concerned about international politics. That that's just the way it goes. Again, uh, uh, George H. W. Bush was probably a. a, a a, an outlier there because of his because of his background, but but by and large presidents are elected on a domestic agenda and they come come to office trying to carry out that agenda. They can't help but be be uh, deeply involved in international affairs, but that's generally not the kind of the first priority. So. Gentlemen up the back, please. Uh, Bruce Paget, um, I don't have any on the one hand, and maintaining um, some sort of. Um, geopolitical uh, stability in the in the region on the other. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would imagine that in post September 11, there's been more concern in amongst the U.S. populace in terms of the non-state actors, um, by comparison with the geopolitical situation mm -hmm. in the uh, in the Pacific. And I wonder whether th those competing aims are going to, in some way, affect the. Uh, uh, the maintenance of uh, U.S. power in the Pacific. You know that's a, that's an excellent question. I, I think one of the um, one of the the biggest challenges that the that the Defense Department in particular faces is balancing um, its its resources and its attention um, against these very different types of types of challenges. Um, as you say, on the one hand, dealing with say Al Qaeda and its associated <coughs> movements. Um, and on the other hand, uh, dealing with uh, what I would call regional rogues, uh, such as uh, such as North Korea with, with nuclear weapons, and then and then dealing with the challenge of of growing Chinese Chinese power, um, it's it's a it's a ch it's on the one hand and maintaining um, some sort of um, geopolitical uh, stability in the in the region on the other. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would imagine that in post September 11 there's been more concern in amongst the US populace in terms of the non-state actors um, by comparison with the geopolitical situation in the uh, in the Pacific and I wonder whether th those competing aims are going to in some way affect the uh, uh, the, the maintenance of uh, US power in the Pacific you know that's, a, that's an excellent question I, I think one of the um one of the, the biggest challenges that the, that the Defense Department in particular faces is balancing um, its, its resources and its attention um, 
against these very different types of types of challenges. Um, as you say, on the one hand, dealing with, say, Al Qaeda and its associated <coughs> movements, um, and on the other hand, uh, dealing with uh, what I would call regional rogues, uh, such as uh, such as North Korea with with nuclear weapons, and then and then dealing with the challenge of of growing Chinese Chinese power. Um, it's it's a it's a ch it's a particularly tricky balance, and has been a particularly tricky balance. Uh, because on the one hand, um, you've had American servicemen and women in combat uh, taking casualties uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, balanced against uh, arguably a you know some more consequential uh, but less uh, tangible um, uh, contingencies in the future, and. You know, I think the the, uh, the the balance in recent years has been, you know, you know, winning the wars that we're that we're fighting, and I, that's hard to deny. Uh, that is a priority. That having been said, as the U.S. draws down in Iraq and Afghanistan, I think you know you you see growing attention uh, to to uh, particularly uh, concerns in in Asia and the Pacific. That having been said, though, if you actually look at what the U.S. has done in terms of our force posture. Even, even as we've been fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, you have seen uh, uh, an increasing presence in Asia and the Pacific. I mean, we now have more than half of our submarine force based in the Pacific, for example. Uh, and when there's, when there's talks about drawing down overseas presence, um, it generally tends to involve areas outside of Asia, Asia and the Pacific. Um, so I, I think you know that there there will be that there will be that tension, uh, but I think more and more, and I think this is this has been something that's been consistent, certainly since actually the 2001 Quadrennial Defense Review, is is the increasing importance of of, of Asia and the Pacific. Um, so I don't necessarily think that I, I think it would be too strong to say that it'll be insulated, or our force posture will be insulated from any cuts. But I certainly think that that uh, I would expect. Fewer cuts in in Asia or in capabilities pertaining to Asia than perhaps uh, in in other areas and other other capability areas. We have time for one more question, and the privilege goes to the lady on my right. A uh, quick one, if you may, me. No problem. This is just a good one to follow on from the last. I'm just wondering. We heard a bit about the foreign debt and the reliance on China in the first speech. So I was wondering, in terms from Tom, how much is it of a growing concern? How much is discussion is happening in sort of the upper? military echelons as to what's happening with reliance on China, especially with the talk of rise of China and the conflict between the US and China in the future? Um, I th well, look, I think, I think that the, the issue of, of, of indebtedness is, um, you know, is something that's, that's widely discussed. Uh, and I think the, uh, and, and I think Mark put it into, into a proportion. I mean, the vast majority of US debt is not held by, by China. It's held and so the, the, the concern, I think, says as much about the U.S.-China relationship as it does indebtedness. Uh, we don't worry about that portion of the debt that's held by Britain or Japan or um, the Netherlands. Um, and, and, you know, and, and it becomes a topic particularly when, you know, when the Chinese government raises it. But I would say it, it is a two-way, it's a two-way street, right? It's, it's, and it's the old economists. Uh, Anecdote about you know when when uh, uh, you know when I owe you uh, ten dollars, you know there's the leverage goes one way. When I owe you a million dollars, the leverage actually goes in the other way. Um, and so, uh, I think you know, uh, hist the historian in me says that you know economics politics trumps economics. Um, and <laughs> sorry, I'm going to have to take the view from the dismal science on that. Yeah. Much. but but in other words, you know that that the political relationship really really will will dominate, um, and that's both good and bad. Um, uh, you know, economic interdependence didn't prevent World War One, for example. Britain and and Germany were highly economically interdependent. They still they still went to war with one another. So there's the downside of it. But on the other hand, I think that the you know this this idea of sort of an economic hostage taking, for the same reason, do, doesn't just doesn't wind up working. And so um, it's something that gets talked about. I, I don't see it as as being determinative. But again, 
I'll turn back to Mark. I, I, could, I could be wrong. 30 seconds from The Economist. No pressure. Hey, hey it depends. <laughs> uh, UK and Suez is kind of the one that everybody will, that brings up as the example of if you have a, a dependent economic relationship. I mean, the United States was able to pull the plug on you know, the, the last flurry of British post-war imperialism through financial might, basically. And um, there's a sort of a risk, you know, periodically people speculate whether the Chinese would be able to do the same. Um, they, it's true that they certainly don't own anywhere near a majority of US debt, they own a, a fraction. They own a large enough fraction that if they pulled, took the nuclear option, decided to dump it all on the market, it would have hugely disruptive financial consequences. It would also have huge disruptive consequences for China itself, though. So the only scenarios in which you see that happening are the scenarios where you know, the relationship's already in such terrible trouble that it's, it's kind of, this is kind of collateral. It, I think it complicates policymaking, because that's a scenario that you have to think about. But it, I'm not sure there's more than that. I think before you push it to that, though, I think it does have it, there's, there's kind of interesting implications. It seems to me that if you think about soft power, for example, um, when you're looking out at the world, if, if you're another economy, are you more likely to respect the country that's in debt and has to borrow from other countries, or do you respect, or are you more likely to respect the country that's in charge of the money and it's lending it out? Um, I think that has some consequences. I don't think they're necessarily huge, but I think it, it kind of matters at the margin. I mean, you know, the more, the, the more financially secure you are, I think that does feed through to power. It, it's not a, a, to use another bit of economic giant, it's not an all else equal scenario. There are a whole sort of other stuff in here too, but it, I, think it, I think there are consequences. I think it does matter. It's, Maybe it doesn't matter as much as the, the, the real pessimists put out there that you know, China just has to flick its fingers and the US will have to run. I mean, I don't, don't buy that at all, but it, it's another complication that if you're a US strategic thinker, I think you have to factor in that here's another lever that, China, that, that Beijing can use to influence the United States. Thank you, gentlemen, for the demonstration of the two lawyer syndrome. <laughs> bit of column A, bit of column B. Ladies and gentlemen, before I close, I'll ask our Deputy Director, David Connery, Dr. David Connery, to offer a vote of thanks to our two speakers. Mark, thank you very much. And it would have been easy tonight to subtitle this the, uh, the Dismal Science of Economics, represented by Mark, meets the Dismal Art of Strategy, uh, represented so ably by Tom, except it would be hard to characterise anything they said tonight as being dismal because of such upbeat, uh, interesting, and precise uh, presentations. But before I get to thanking you more formally and fully, um, National Security College is really great to, uh, or really uh, pleased to, uh, to see you come along and it's great to have you here again. For many of you, I've started to recognise a number of faces for these uh, seminars. Our next seminar will be on the 18th of October where we'll look at nuclear, nuclear non-proliferation and regional security. And uh, Professor Ramesh Thakur and Dr Rob Floyd, the Director General of the Australian Safeguards and Non-Proliferation Office, uh, will be presenting that seminar for us. On some other advertisements, uh, Applications are now open for our graduate studies program uh, for entry into 2012. We've reshaped really this program slightly and I'd encourage anyone who's interested to have a look at the website uh, to uh, come up to date with what we're doing. But again, we're anticipating this being another exciting year in 2012. Also, we're hoping to be able to make a very exciting announcement about our PhD program uh, shortly. So if you're thinking at all about PhD studies uh, here at the National Security College, watch the website. But back to our speakers. Uh, Tom. You're a great friend of Australia. You're a man who has a significant knowledge of what we do, and it's great to have you uh, in America who's able to explain Australia and Australia's situation uh, so well. Equally, it's great to have you come here uh, to talk about America, and that just if you tell by the intensity of the questions and the number of them, uh, people are very, very interested in this particular topic. Uh, for Mark, too, great to welcome him back to the uh, college. We, can, we always get Mark to come to talk to the college whenever we can, and tonight, You've, uh, you've certainly helped us to understand those key points, and Mark, you put them forward so crisply. I thank you both for that. Uh, can I also congratulate Mark and Ash for uh, putting the seminar together and also for the assistance they received from, uh, from Debbie, Renee, and also Sharon. But lastly, can I thank you for coming. I look forward to seeing you again next time, and can I ask you to once again thank our speakers for what was a really entertaining seminar.